in the last lecture, uh, we went up to point, page 6.6, .6, and I could not finish the, uh, the last part, which was a derivation of a very important equation. Uh, the derivation which is on this page is something which I think it, this actually was a uh, past paper uh, question uh, just a few years ago. So again, I mentioned that some of these derivations are important to know, and this is probably one of them. I'm just quickly going, I'm going to go through these equations here to show how you end up with, with these um, relationships between R, CP, and CV. So, looking at this figure, I said that we've got a uh, piston and a cylinder, and you can imagine that the work in this case is going to be displacement work. So, starting with our, um, with our equation here, we said that we're going to have delta uh, Q equals CV dt. And um, plus delta uh, W. Now, that is, I could rewrite delta W because it's a displacement, uh, displacement work then that is PDV. Now, we also know that CV delta T is equal to DU. Why? Because CV was DU DT. So, DU plus P um, DPV. The reason why I'm, I'm bringing this into the bracket here is because P is constant. And that's actually the reason why P is constant is because of the problem. If you look at the problem here, there's a fixed weight on the, uh, on the system, which means if the, uh, let's say air is in this, in this case, air is expanded, um, the, the weight on this system is going to be adjusted. Therefore, the pressure is going to be, you know, it's going to go up and down, therefore maintaining the same pressure in the cylinder. And if pressure is constant, I'm allowed to bring pressure inside the bracket in here. So I'm going to have DPV. Then, if I go back again to CVDT for now, what I can do now, I can change this term to RDT. Why I can do that? Well, We've been using the relationship PV equals RT. And if you look at that sort of relationship, you see here we've got PV. And I'm now changing that to RT because of this uh, equation of state. Now, the other thing which I've, I've done uh, was to realize that when you have... Um, in this case, for example, when I have du plus PD, dpv, that is equal to du plus pv equals dh. Therefore, I know that delta q is equal to dh, which is now, in this case, is equal to cv dt plus r dt. Can I now start writing this as, I can write dh as CV plus R DT. So remember for now, let's just name this equation as 1. If I now assume, assuming based on uh, the two property rule that we've been talking about so far, if I now assume that um, H which is entropy is a function of pressure and temperature. You know I could select any two property. In this case, let me just assume a pressure and temperature. Then that means that I can write dH being equal to dH dt at constant pressure dt plus dH dp at constant temperature, dp. And the reason why I've got two terms here is because of p and t. Now, this is going to disappear because 
we established through those three experiments, which I went through last week, the, um, the Joule Thomson experiment, we showed that enthalpy was only a function of temperature. Therefore, that term would disappear. And I also know that this term is equal to what we define as Cp. Therefore, dH will be equal to Cp dt. All these analysis actually are, sorry, um, all these equations are actually in your, um, on your, in your notes on page 6.6, .6, but maybe this is actually easier uh, to understand what exactly has been done. Now, if I assume that this is equation two, by combining one and two, I arrive at something quite important, and that is dH is equal to Cp dt equal to Cv plus R dt. And that means Cp will be equal to Cv plus R, and therefore R is equal to Cp minus Cv. And these are the two equations which you see in the bottom of, um, of page 6.6. .6. This now relates, so I talked about the um, characteristic gas constant, which is this R. You remember we had two R's. We had the universal gas constant, which was that curly, fancy R. And we had this simple R, which is the characteristic one. The way that you calculate R is by the difference between Cp and Cv. Later on, um, we'll see another relationship between Cp and Cv, uh, but we'll come back to that. Um, for now, let's just rem remember that this is uh, how these three parameters are actually are connected to each other. So, let's move on now. Let's move on to page 6.7. Of course, this is the more generic equation when you have an ideal gas. Why? Because Cp and Cv are functions of temperature uh, and they're not constant. Remember in a perfect gas, Cp and Cv are constant, but in an ideal gas, they vary depending on the temperature. And therefore, that generic form is for the ideal gases. Now, if I want to write this, or the sort of the, the, the previous equation about enthalpy in the um, uh, in the integral form, then I could write this as H, which is now in this case is only a function of temperature as we know, Cp delta T, uh, Cp dt if you like, plus H zero, which is a reference enthalpy. Again, that just emphasizes that um, the reference enthalpy doesn't really matter what that is because as I mentioned last uh, in the last lecture, we are normally interested in the difference in entropy. Therefore, whatever you use as a reference entropy doesn't make a huge difference. Um, and therefore, this equation is just one way of, uh, of defining um, entropy. Now, looking at, so, so far we've been looking at a closed system. That piston-cylinder combination that you saw is a closed system. Nothing is going in or out. Everything's conserved within this volume. If you have an open system, like the turbine, compressor, um, heat exchanger, and other systems that we've reviewed uh, in our previous lectures, then you have to s change the, um, the equations and the steady flow energy equation uh, in a slightly different way. Now, if you don't remember these equations, um, please have a look at page 5.5. Uh, in chapter five, when we were talking about the open systems, and you can see the terms here, we had entropy, we had the kinetic energy, the potential energy, the heat, and the shaft work. And the reason why you have only the shaft work here is because we've moved entropy to the left-hand side, which comes from the displaced work. And that E superscript H represents, uh, again, on, if you look at page 5.5, you'll see where that E came from. That's the internal energy um, when you are using entropy in the definition. And the only thing to change here is to replace dH by Cp dt. Basically, this is exactly what we've, we showed 
on the previous page. These equations will be given to you. So these are, you can find a variation of these equations in your formula sheet. Um, there's no need to memorize any of, the, any of them, but it's important to understand the application and the meaning of each term. So, let's now move on to polytropic processes. If you remember, we introduced polyt polytropic processes on page um, 2.10 in chapter 2 when we were talking about heat and um, uh, work and heat. Essentially, the way that polytropic process is, is defined is any process in which the pressure and specific volume are, will actually change according to this equation. PV to the power of N, where N could be any number, is, equal, uh, is actually a constant. And, of course, a very important figure, which I want you all to remember, and I said it's actually quite important to remember that, that's a PV diagram uh, where we had different combinations of the value of N. This was N equal to zero, this, this was N equal to infinity, this was N bigger than one, and this was n equal to 1. And each of these four curves represented one of those four ideal scenarios or, or cases. For example, this was the um, isobaric, which means the pressure is constant. This was the, um, uh, the isochoric, which was the, the specific volume was, was, was constant. n equal to 1 was isothermal, temperature was constant. And n bigger than 1 represents isentropic which we'll come back to this in, in our last chapter when we talk about entropy. Now, what is important here is that these three equations, you can find them exactly in this form, well, it's slightly different with uh, some change in the numbering, in your formula sheet. These are the equations that you would use in order to, to calculate your work depending on what the value of n is. Something that we're going to use now is actually to see how these can be used or how these are changed when it comes to a, uh, a polytropic process involving a, um, an ideal gas. So we looked at some scenarios where we had, um, for example, um, I mean, we didn't sort of look at any examples specifically, but we looked at some examples where we did use these equations. What I want, what I want to do now is actually to show that these equations, using the PV equals RT equation of state, which we've been using so far, each of these equations actually can be revised and rewritten using, for example, the characteristic gas constant and temperature by replacing PV by RT. So these are given to you, as I mentioned, in the uh, formula sheet. These are not given. And therefore, I would expect you to be able to, if you need to use R and T form, I would expect you to be able to derive these equations, which are quite easy, from the basic equations. And you can see here, for example, P V2 minus V1 is replaced by RT2 minus T1. Um, here in the numerator, we've got P1 V1 minus P2 V2. Here we have R T1 minus uh, T2, just very similar. And in the case of, of n equal to 1, which represents the isothermal case, um, what we've changed is, is PV to RT. And you've maintained the uh, you know, V2 over V1. Alternatively, what you could write is you could replace V2 over V1 by P1 over P2. Why? Because in a polytropic process, where n is equal to 1, you have this type of relationship. P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. Therefore, that allows you to rewrite these equations in, the, in this form as well. It is important to know all these forms because some questions would give you a certain, um, for example, in one problem, you could be given the value of pressure at point 1 and point 2, and also the value of the characteristic uh, gas constant, in which case this is the sort of equation that you would use in, in that case. 
if you try to use this, for example, for that particular problem, then you're going to struggle because you have to do a lot of more calculations in order to find the parameters which are used in this equation. Therefore, it's important to be aware of these uh, alternative forms. Something else which I would expect you to know, and again, it's the derivation. Uh, it's not derivation, it's just an alternative form of, of presenting um, the um, polytropic process when it comes to uh, the equation of state. So essentially, I'm saying that if PV equals RT, which we all know by now, um, we can use that a lot. I have, I can rewrite this as, so if I keep V here, I can write this as RT over P. So that allows me to, this is V now, as you can see from here, RT over P. And of course, that is still has to be a constant. If I s further simplify this equation on the left-hand side, I've got 2p here, I've got p here, and I've got p to the power of minus n. That will become p to the power of 1 minus n. r is a constant, therefore r to the power of n is going to be constant as well, therefore I can get rid of that. And I'm going to be left with t to the power of n. So that is another form, or an another alternative form of the polytropic process, which is not going to be given to you, but very simple substitution, you can derive this equation and use it in a lot of problems, depending on what value has been given to you in, in, in the question. So that's, in addition to PV equals RT, that's another form which you need to know. The second form is this. And how is it done? This time, I'm going to go back to this equation, and I'm going to say, I could maintain, I could keep P on the left-hand side and move V to the right-hand side. Therefore, I'm going to have RT divided by V. And that's what I've done here. That's my pressure. And by doing that, again, R is constant, so I can get rid of that. I keep T. And I've got two Vs here, so it's going to be V to the power of N minus 1. And that gives you another equation, or another alternative form of the equation of state. But this equation, or these two equations, they don't mean that they are applicable to any ideal gas scenario. They are only applicable to situations where you have an ideal gas, or perfect gas, also a polytropic process. So the, 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 the gas in that particular problem has to be governed by a polytropic equation in order for you to be able to use these equations. Here, I've listed the, the three very common ways of defining um, equations uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the polytropic process. And to be honest, actually, in, in a lot of scenarios and a lot of situations, you will get a polytropic process. And therefore, knowing these alternative forms of the equation of states would be quite useful, as you will see in this example here. I believe this example uh, is actually very similar to one of the exam, again, one of the exam papers, um, one of the questions in the exam paper in the past few years. So, we've got five kilogram of gas, that's our M, initially at the temperature of 298 Kelvin, that is um, our T1. Now, at a pressure of one bar, that's P1, is now heated to 600 Kelvin, which is T2, and P2. The things that we want to find is the work done. That is uh, W12. The change in internal, en in the internal energy, which is um, delta U. And the total heat transferred, which is Q12. These are the three parameters which we need to find. And remember, we've we've got to be working with the P and T type of equation. Um, therefore, out of these three forms, it's now obvious that this is the one that would be relevant. Sorry. This is the one that would be relevant here. There are also some assumptions here. Normally, this is the case. The value of R is given to you, 
and the value of CP or CV will be given as well. In this case, you have, you've got the value of CP, but this is not um, a constant. And in, in fact, this is a function of temperature and R, which again suggests that you're dealing with an ideal gas because if CV, for example, CP here, for example, was a constant, you knew that this is a perfect gas, uh, which was you know, slightly easier. Now, the question, how do we know that this is a polytropic? The question has to state that this is a polytropic process. Otherwise, you just can't assume that whenever you have P and, and T, uh, and you've got an ideal gas, you can just use the, uh, you know, one of these equations uh, in order to answer the question. It's only when you have a polytropic process again. So I, I emphasize on that because I've seen people making the same mistake of applying these equations to problems which are not polytropic. So, there is, um, you might, I mean, th this, this equation, which comes from here, um, if you're struggling to find out how that is done, I mean, it's just a simple arithmetic, so I'm not going to go through details, really. Um, but one way of doing it, an alternative way, if, you're non, if you don't understand how we got that form, is um, to say that P1 over P2 to the power of... Um, 1 minus n is equal to T2 over T1 to the power of n. So essentially all I've done, I've taken this to the right-hand side and changed the, um, the power from n minus 1 to 1 minus n. And as you can see, I've got that here. And I use T2 over T1 to the power of n. If, if, <coughs> if you put that as the um, starting point, then... In a way, it's actually easier because then it le this leads to uh, P1 over P2 to the power of 1 divided by P1 over P2 divided by n, so to the power of n, T2, T1, n. And I, could, I can now take this to the right-hand side and say P1 over P2 is T2, T1, P1, P2, all to the power of n. And of course, the last step is, is important because it's a now a lot easier. Because the power is n, and I'm after the value of n, this is a lot easier mathematically to find my value. And if I do ln on both sides, then I'm going to have ln of P1 over P2. And here I'm going to have n times ln of T2, T1, P1, P2. I'm just going to zoom in. There's not very much space here, so I'm going to zoom in to see what I've done. Sorry, it's, a bit, it's not the best way of writing. But now, you can see the reason why I've done in this form is because this allows me to find the value of n a lot easier. If you want to use this form, that's fine. But the issue is then you have to be good in terms of using the ln or the, you know, any type of uh, logarithm in order to find out what is the value of n. In any case, whether you use this way or this way, you find the value of n as 1.641. Once you know the value of n, then you start looking at the equations which I showed on the previous page. And I said these are the equations which are not normally given to you in the, in the formula sheet, and you have to find them or derive them from the uh, generic form of the, um, of the equations. Um, so let me just quickly show you where I got that equation from. Uh, because in, in this case, n is bigger than 1, therefore I have that situation. So you would start from this equation, and you would use this equation. So that's from there. It's easy to put all the numbers in there, and it gives you the value of w. But this is the specific work, and I'm after the total amount of work, which is the capital W. You have to multiply by the mass, and you get the value of the work in joules or kilojoules, and then it's going to be negative in this case. Now, the next step is to find the internal energy. 
The equation that you would use for the internal energy is the one that we derived earlier uh, in the beginning of this lecture, which was essentially du equals to CV delt, uh, dt. The reason why I've got T dash in the bracket here, this is just to emphasize that, as I know, CV is a function of temperature. It's not a constant value, therefore, it's a function of temperature somehow. And based on the other relationship which we derived, which was CP minus CV equals R, which means CV is equal to CP minus R, I'm going to use that in order to replace CV. And I'm going to replace it with CP minus R. Why? Because you don't know the value of CV in the problem. In the problem, you only know the value of CP. So you've got to change the equation that you use in order to have the parameters that are given to you in the problem. When I do this, then that's actually a lot easier. And all I need to do now is actually to do the disintegration. In fact, this actually reminds me that this very similar problem was given in last year's uh, exam paper. Uh, and I, the reason why I remember that now is actually because I was reading, I was marking the questions, and even though this, this bit is actually quite simple, it's all mathematics, there's nothing to do with, with thermodynamics, uh, and lots of people actually struggled. When you're under stress in exam, um, and you have limited amounts of time, if you're not really good with integration, and you're not really strong in maths, then you, know, you might actually make the smallest mistake and you get a completely wrong answer. Anyway, what you will see here is that I've replaced CPT with the equation which was given to me in the problem. This is exactly what was given in the question. And you've got now two R's which you can take out of the uh, integration because it's constant. And the rest is, as I mentioned, is just um, simple mathematics. And at the end, when you simplify this, you end up with the value of delta U, which is um, 1.271 megajoules. Again, very important to put the dimension and the unit after each answer, or after each quantity. When you're dealing with, when you're dealing with the first law, then obviously all four components in the, in the first law equation, they're all in joules or joules per kilogram, depending on whether you're working with, um, you know, either you're, lo you're looking at U2 minus U1. Uh, I mean, if you're looking at this equation, actually written here, if you're using this equation or this form of the first law, then you know that everything's in, in joules. So that, that's easy. Now, the last step is to find the total heat transfer. And you've got, you know this, you know this. It's just a simple um, change. Uh, and substitution in order to find what is your Q. If this question was given to you in the exam, would you be able to do it? Yeah? No? Come on, this is easy. I mean, you, you're gonna have about 15 minutes to do this, this question in the exam. That's quite reasonable, right? I hope so. We'll see. Okay, the rest, of, the rest of this lecture, or this chapter really, is just building up on some of the stuff that we've mentioned very briefly when I was introducing the ideal gas and perfect gas. But we're now ex expanding those, those topics a little bit. This, this part here is talking about a perfect gas, and I, I explained uh, earlier what is the difference between a perfect gas and ideal gas in terms of the value of CP and CV, and it's just, uh, you know, really is emphasizing on that. The thing to mention is that in the case of a perfect gas, CP and CV, which we know are going to be defined as dH over dt or du by dt, we know they're going to be equal to constant, which then it means, and this is a sort of a byproduct of, of, that, um, uh, of that equation which means that in this case, H and R are linear functions of T. So if you wanted to, for example, draw, um, I know, UT, then it would be something like this, in the case of a perfect gas. 
Whereas if this was an ideal gas, that wouldn't be the case because CP would, would vary. Now let's just now move on to alternative forms uh, for the equation of state. This is, uh, this bit, again, I think I've, I've mentioned in passing uh, when I was talking about the use of the density. So remember, starting with PV RT, if I now multiply both sides with M, then of course I'm going to have PMV MRT. That's going to become volume. And the other thing I can do, or an alternative form of doing it, so this is one form that is quite common. In a lot of situations, you're going to start with this form in engineering because mass um, is quite important. Alternatively, one thing you could do when it comes to PV equals RT was to actually move V to the right-hand side and then realizing that small v is the inverse of the density. And so occasionally you might actually see the equation of state expressed in this form, P equals rho RT. Probably this is not as common, but it's good to, uh, to understand where it comes from. On, you know, in cases where you saw that equation, you're not going to panic and you know exactly where, you know, what it means. Okay. Now, we're going to go back to a little bit of chemistry. Um, I'm not sure if you're a big fan of chemistry. I, I wasn't. Uh, never. Uh, but this is the part which there is some overlap between chemistry and some dynamics, so we've got to go through it, unfortunately. Um, but, well, let's, let's see what uh, you know, chemists normally do every day. So we've got the molar form of the equation of state. Why do we have to care about this? Again, I, I talked about Avogadro's hypothesis. Um, I talked about the, the, the definition of mole, which is, which is important. Because when it comes to gases, for example, when you're looking at CO2 or when you're looking at CO or CH4, um, a lot of these random sounds and noise that you know, come every now and then from your phones and devices. Um, so the reason why we have to understand the molar form of some of these equations is because sometimes we're looking at some chemical reactions. Look at this equation. This is a very common um, type of reaction that um, may, you may have seen actually when you're, dealing, when you're dealing with combustion, you will see that. This is when, this is methane, which you know is the main constituent of natural gas. Um, and you've got hydrogen. So when you're burning, for example, methane, or when methane comes in contact with hydrogen, then you're going to have CH3 plus um, hydrogen. This is methyl. I don't want you to remember any of these. You don't, you're not going to use them really, uh, ever. But, you know, uh, essentially this is a typical chemical reaction. And the reason why I'm using this very simple chemical reaction is because it allows us to do some calculations in terms of the molar value, some calculations in terms of mass, etc. So let's now go back to our Avogadro's hypothesis. This is a nice figure. I tried to explain uh, on Monday what it really means. But look at this. Um, th we've got two containers. One is, uh, one actually has H2 hydrogen, one has uh, CO2. Basically, if you assume that P1 is equal to P2, and if you assume that T1 is equal to T2, so this is container one, this is container two, and if you, if you assume that this is the assumption in, in this case, what Avogadro's hypothesis really states is that you're gonna have exactly the same number of molecules or atoms or particles in each um, container. So if this is one billion, billion, billion um, uh, particles, you're gonna have exactly the same number in here as well, even though you're dealing with two different gases, CO2 and H2. And that's the case with anything else. If this was nitrogen, if this was oxygen, this would be exactly the same. Again, provided that the pressure and temperature in both containers are the same. 
And that number, or that universal number, is what we define as the um, Avogadro's constant, which is written here. That's a ridiculous, ridiculously large number which represents how much or how, ma how many particles you're going to have <coughs> in one mole of gas. Anyway, the, the interesting thing about this is that, yes, so the number of particles are equal. So as far as the, the volume is concerned, we understand that. But what about the mass? If you were to weigh these two containers, so if I put this and this on a scale, M2 is going to be by far bigger than M1. In fact, 22 times bigger. And of course, it sort of makes sense because one element of H2 is a lot lighter, it's 22 times lighter than one element of one particle of, of CO2. And that's why, when it comes to engineering problems, and because mass makes a huge difference in a lot of scenarios, that's why we have to be converting some of these equations and express them in terms of mass. And that's why we define what we, we know as the, um, the uh, molecular weight, which is mw. Now, this is a dimensionless number doesn't have any dimensions, it's the mass of one molecule of substance divided by one twelfth of the mass of, of uh, carbon-12. And again, I said carbon-12 is the basis for a lot of things that we do because it's the most abundant form of carbon and carbon-12 is actually a very fundamental um, element in chemistry, therefore that is our reference. And one molecule of of carbon has actually 12 um, um, components. Uh, therefore, we want 112 of that as a reference. So anyway, this is MW, is the convention which we use um, uh, as the molecular weight. How do we use that? This is actually a, um, I want you to pay attention to this statement here, which might, if you haven't thought about it, actually, um, it addresses one of the, um, what seems to be a, 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 an inconsistency in, in the things that we've been saying, but actually this is what makes sense, not to us, but to chemists. Now, so a quantity having the same numerical value as MW for one mole of substance is the molar mass, and it's M. In fact, we're not going to be dealing with MW a lot of times. We're going to be dealing with M. Now, what we're saying is, they mean exactly the same thing. MW is dimensionless, but M actually has a unit of gram per mole or kilogram per kilomole, which are exactly the same, as I mentioned. So don't be confused by, by that. And in order to convert the molar mass of a gas to the associated mass, we use this equation. So this is the mass which we normally want to use, and that is in grams. This is, as I mentioned, is in, let's say, gram per mole. And this is mole. And of course, through dimensional analysis, that makes sense. And we are consistent. This is the important bit. This is the sort of information that we, as engineers, uh, will use. Look at this table. This table actually is given to you in your formula sheet, in data sheet. So you don't have to memorize these, even though it's quite handy to, to know them. <coughs> For example, one molecule of hydrogen will have the mass of two. So one kilomole of hydrogen at a uh, molecule will have the mass of two kilograms. That is actually what it means. Um, by the way, remember I talked about that, that example, the container, and I said it's actually 22 times bigger? This is actually, you can see why 
where that 22 comes from. So anyway, looking at each of these, and these are, the, these are not ob obviously the only elements, these are just the, the, uh, the most common elements. You could have lots of different things. And in order to demonstrate that, let's just do one example. Find the mass of six, kilo, six kilomole of hydrogen. So starting with this equation, this is what we are after. We want to find out the mass. This capital M is the one that you need to find from this table, which in this case, you just go to the table and see oxygen is 32 times the number of moles which you have in the problem, six, which is now 192 kilogram. So if you had, this is essentially what it means, if you had six kilomole of CO2 in a container, and if you weigh that container, it's gonna be, um, you know, the, the mass of that is gonna be 192 kilogram. So actually kilomole is not a small unit. It's, um, imagine one mole would contain that ridiculous number of elements in it. So that number of elements in one mole. And imagine how much that would be when you, when you have six kilomole, so 6,000 of that. Anyway, something, um, let's just another example which is more, slightly more complicated and this is actually where it becomes quite interesting is because Let's now assume that you've got 1.8 kilogram of this um, combination, whatever that is. That is one component which is not in this table, right? And this is why I said this table is not uh, on an exhaustive uh, list. So CH3OH, when it comes to any um, substance, like this one in this case, you've got to look at each element and calculate the mass for each element and then add them up and find that one single figure. It's, it's quite basic how we, how we do it. So this is carbon, this is 12, you can see that from the table. This is H3, now this is a molecule of, of, of hydrogen, so one atom of hydrogen which is just H1 is 1, therefore H3 would be 3. Oxygen. This is a molecule of oxygen, therefore it has 32, the M is 32, which means for just one atom of oxygen, that would be 16. And so when you have one oxygen atom, then you have it's one times 16. And again, going back to hydrogen here, it's one times one. If you add them up, you get 32. Now, if you've got 1.8 kilogram, and if you want to find out the number of moles, that's again the same equation I use, and that's the number of moles in expressing kilomoles for that particular problem. The rest of um, this chapter really is about um, is about um, relating the sort of analysis that we've done to the universal gas constant, which is actually quite interesting. So let's look at, <coughs> again, the same example. So going back to this form of the equation, so I'm, I'm gonna start with PV MRT, and I'm gonna replace M with M times N. Therefore, that's a sort of a, a newish um, way of expressing our equation of states, which is not very common but we, we just show that uh, here, we use it to d demonstrate something important. I want to look at this equation now for the two containers that we've been talking about. And I'm interested to take T to the left-hand side and express my equation of a state in these two forms. Because of the assumptions which I mentioned earlier, the pressure and temperature are gonna be equal for both containers. Therefore, the left-hand side will be equal to each other. Of course, that means that the right-hand side has to be equal to each other as well. So that combination would be equal to this, and that would be equal to this. What's the implication of that? Well, 
you assume that that's, that's right, then that means that I can set NH2 equal to NCO2, which I don't care for now, I don't care about this. What I'm interested is in this. This means that the molecular weight times the characteristic gas constant for H2 is actually equal to MR for CO2, despite having very different masses, which we've, we showed, CO2 being 22 times mm, uh, more, uh, 22 times heavier than hydrogen, that combination actually, M times R, would give you the same value. And actually, this is not only for CO2. This would be the same for MR N2, I don't know, uh, MR um, carbon monoxide, etc. And that just, you know, I could use an unlimited number of examples. What's the implication of that? If that's the case, so if M times R gives you something quite common, this is what we're going to call the universal gas constant. <clears throat> As the name suggests, that's the, the fancy R, which we introduced uh, in the first lecture. When I was talking about, uh, on Monday, when I was talking about uh, ideal gases, and therefore, for any of these gases, the universal gas constant applies, uh, and it's applicable. But normally, it's the characteristic gas constant that we, we want to use. Let's do one more example this time. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at methane, CH4. The starting point, I want to find out the characteristic gas constant, R, for methane. And this is actually what you're going to be doing. This is exactly what you're going to be doing in a lot of situations. When you are given a particular gas, uh, you know, ideal gas or perfect gas, you need to do the same analysis. You need to find out the MW or the, the, uh, the mass, a molecular mass, which is 1 times 12 plus 4 times 1. Carbon is 12, and this is 4. So that gives you 16. And by the simple equation of the universal gas constant divided by that number, you get what is the universal gas constant for methane. In, um, we're not going to have time to finish off this chapter, unfortunately, but uh, what I'm going to say here actually is that this is the second relationship which I said would relate CP to CV. You've been looking at gamma, or you've, you've seen gamma in, in uh, maybe you've used it before as well. And in fact, gamma is the ratio of CP to CV. So, so far, we've seen that R is the, ratio, is the difference between CP and CV. Now, if you divide them by each other, you end up with gamma, which is, again, a very useful uh, quantity or, or parameter in gases. Something which we are talking about here is the fact that if in this, if you're looking at the polytropic process, if you replace N by gamma, then you're going to end up with exactly the same equations, but these equations are applicable to an isentropic process. I remember this was another exam question, I think, um, and a lot of people got confused. They, were, they weren't sure that they can, they can use the same equations that are, are applicable to uh, polytropic processes, even though the problem was looking at an isotrop isentropic process, the equations were exactly the same as a polytropic. All you had to do was to change n to gamma and use the same equations. So I would say put a note here for yourself that this is important. <clears throat> now, this bit plus the next page, as you can see, is for your information only. That's optional. Um, so it goes all the way to page 6.16. So this bit on the next page, again, these are all 
Optional. So you don't have to go through them. Well, you, you can, but these are not, you're not going to be assessed on, the, on these. There's only one page left. I was hoping to finish this off. Um, <clears throat> I think what I, what I can do, I can ask you to actually go through this page yourself. The reason why I'm saying that is because there are going to be two examples here. Here, one example here, and the second example here. And these are essentially looking at finding out the value of R, which is the gas constant, characteristic gas constant, for air in the second example, and something similar to air, uh, which is just having nitrogen and oxygen. And um, you end up with values, with two values here. Actually, the, the, um, the second one, is, um, there's no solution to this. I, I've just done it as, a, um, as an exercise. But you will end up with the value of R as, um, I think it's 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Because I want to stick to our timetable, I, I think I'm going to ask you to go through this yourself. This, this bit is only relevant in situations where you have a gas, something you know, similar to, to air, where you don't have only one substance, you have two or three substances. Air, for example, has nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, and carbon dioxide. Uh, and in that case, calculating the, uh, the universal gas constant, uh, characteristic gas constant is slightly more difficult. And these examples here will show you exactly how to do it. Any questions before we stop? If you have questions about the, uh, the quiz or the assessment on Monday, the 19th of March, I'm going to be talking about the exam, uh, the assessment, I think, on Monday. I will give you some information, but the instruction is now on, on Blackboard, so please go through those instructions. There's also a trial run, which you can just test uh, and see how you get on with the, uh, you know, it's not meant to be an assessing you or a trial for the questions. It's more about the platform and the use of the, uh, the, 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 the page. Um, but guys, pay attention to this. You, it is important to, for you to be here, what I mean here, not in this room, but to be present on the university campus in order to be able to access the quiz. There's no excuse for you to be away. I know some people say, oh, actually, unfortunately, I, I'm actually on, on holiday or something. But this is, I know it's actually the week before Easter, but you're supposed to be here for a lecture. And so, and obviously you knew this from the timetable, um, so there was no excuse in book, booking a holiday uh, beforehand. So, unless there's a very good reason um, for, for you being away, um, unfortunately you have to be here.